So I'm a little challenged uh, about why you should be listening to me after the incredible uh, talks we've had uh, so far on uh, smart government, smart cities, and it seems like smart everything, whether it be 5G or the cloud or whatnot. And, uh, the reason why I do think you should actually listen to me for the next half hour is the one challenge of those first three presentations that we had the privilege of listening to today is if they're all right, then it shouldn't matter where you live. You could do this, uh, you could do your business, you could do whatever you're doing in Perry Sound or Barry or on the beach on a long, uh, long walk on a beach or wherever it happens to be. But there's something that is wrong with that thesis. And it was a Thomas Friedman book called The World is Flat that you may have heard about or read about about 15 years ago that was challenged by Richard Florida who said that's not right. The world is not flat. No matter we have this incredible internet, this incredible communications, this ability to travel around the world, the world is not flat, it's very spiky. You want to make a lot of money, you want to have great businesses, you want to have innovation, you want to have patents, you got to go to New York or London or Paris or maybe Toronto. There's something about cities and cities that work well together where the innovation happens and the network that we all want to enjoy occurs. And that's what I want to talk to you about for the next half hour or so. And I've I got three questions for you. The first is how are we going to live in the future? How are we going to thrive in the future? and how we're gonna move in the future, because I believe that the key is an argument that I'm gonna to present to you called connectedness. And transit, transformational transit, is the only practical way, other than if the Jetson, come, the Jetson pro prospect comes true, that we're all gonna be flying around in, in little uh, airplane uh, cars. But without that, the only solution is transformational transit, and it's up to people like us in this room to make this happen. As it was said, I'm on uh, the board uh, chair of something called Transit Alliance, and that's why I'm here today to, to try to convince you of the importance of this. So we know this. The last century has been defined by this, with someone in the back seat going, are we there yet? And why has that happened? It's because we have thought that building highways was a public investment, while we thought that building transit was for some reason a wasteful subsidy. And how did that come about is the key that I want to change in the future. So one second on Transit Alliance and what Transit Alliance is. It's a group of over 150 companies in the greater Toronto area that get together to spur civic interest in, involvement in, and, uh, uh, and, and desire to invest in transit. We have monthly dinners with interesting people, the TTC uh, president, the head of Metrolinx, uh, the uh, principal secretary to the, the cabinet, etc., to talk to the decision makers in small dinner meetings about what we can do to move transit forward. We have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, every twice a year, a fairly sizable conference comparable to this on smart cities, on green cities, on, uh, on 3 p partnerships, etc. And uh, we've got uh, an opportunity to make a change because I think if you take a look, and I'm going to argue to the, you, you to this, uh, in cities worldwide where they've made major transit investment, it's not because of political pressure. It's not because of political leadership, though that's critically important. It's because people like you actually demand it. In London, in Paris, in New York, the people that demand transit investment and transformational transit was people like you. So let's think about it for a second. Uh, we've had some interesting uh, descriptions of how technology has changed over the last uh, 400 years. Well, in the last 100 years, we have been defined by the manufacturing age. We had big plants in the, on the outskirts and the exurbs uh, that were zoned to be away from uh, cities that's led to what's on the right-hand side of this page, which is suburban sprawl, and we all know that. But let's think about for a second what that era for the last 100 years has created. It's created jobs that were in manufacturing centers on the suburbs. Highways everywhere, cars, cars everywhere, parking lots everywhere, where people have said there's more parking lot in North America, at least south of the 55th parallel, than there is green space. Um, high cost of infrastructure. People think that the infrastructure actually in suburbs is less expensive, but we've now come to the conclusion that the cost of infrastructure, sewers, roads, um, hydro wires, etc., in suburbs is actually more expensive. It's cheaper in an urban environment. We've had urban bankruptcies. People have moved out of Detroit and out of Chicago to the suburbs, and the center cities become bankrupt. We have suburban sprawl. We have urban decay. We have climate change issues where actually suburbs and cars and transit, 40% of our climate change challenges come from cars, and I think we know that. Commute time, we've got a commute time over 35 minutes on average, uh, twice a day in uh, Toronto. And it's actually led to a racial divide where we've got, as we know in Toronto now, two or three different cities where uh, one race and the rich live in the center city of Rosedale Forest Hill and the balance of the city may be very different. So it's created an interesting environment. 
In the last 20 years, there's been a plethora of studies and books and authors and speeches on there's something special about cities, particularly cities that work. And what is it? It's connectivity. It's this fancy word called agglomeration, which it means a whole bunch of us together in one spot. And most importantly, it's about idea sharing. So let's talk about this. The world is not flat. And even though we can communicate everywhere, we can have a smart city and we have 5G in the future and things like this, we have global travel. The reality is, and you know this, if you want to make really good money in banking, you go to New York or London. If you want to make really good money in engineering and architecture, you go to certain cities. And, and, and it's a fascinating reality of this world that even though we think academically the world should be flat, we know the world is really spiky, and that's why when our kids graduate from school, Richard Florida's written book that the second most important decision you make in your life after who you're going to marry is where you're going to live, because where you're going to live is going to end up creating a lot of a probability for your success uh, in the future. And it's academic terms that we know about, the benefits of agglomeration, of spillover benefits. But it's also practical things like a sense of place. We want to go to TIFF. We want to go to the opera. We want to go to the theater. We're not happy just watching stuff uh, even though we do, on the GO train uh, on, uh, on our uh, smartphone. Because it's about both collaboration and competition, and you only get that in a place which got to a whole bunch of people working together. And it's livability, and it's connectedness that is key. Now this is a, a difficult concept to uh, explain, but let me try. If you take a look at mammals, and you do a linear regression on the size of a mammal, the mass of a mammal, as the mass of a mammal increases, the metabolism slows down and it's a linear regression. So if you compare an ant and a mouse to an elephant, their gestation time in birth, their lifespan, their metabolism, their heart rate, how fast they walk, everything slows down. And it's a linear regression for all mammals. And for those engineers in the room, it's a power log linear regression. And it's almost perfectly fitting. Well, the exact same concept applies to cities. As the mass of population of a city increases, the metabolism of the city increases. Wages go up, bank deposits go up, GDP goes up, patents go up, R&D goes up, and cities become more efficient. The number of gas stations, the number of roads, the number of electrical cables, the number of cell phone towers, everything that you need to run the city goes down. So it's the opposite of mammals. The metabolism goes up, and that's why it's spiky. Now, a lot of people um, have suggested a concept I use sometimes to describe why this is so critically important. Maybe something that I can't put on a slide, so I didn't put on a slide. But to the 5% rule that the gentleman before me mentioned, if you don't remember anything else that I say, this is the 5% that I don't want you to forget. The key here is the idea sharing. And what is the idea sharing? The best term I found about it was in a book that was published two years ago that said what it is, it's idea sex. And think about that for a second. You know as well as I do that the vast majority of ideas that end up becoming this uh, fantastic blockchain company or something else are never the subject of one person in a shower, even though we think that it is. It's the subject of a bunch of people getting together and thinking about how they're going to create a business. And that's what idea sex is all about. It's ideas that mutate, that reproduce, that, that, that do those things. And you can only do that in a dense urban environment where we connect. And so if you don't remember anything else, Think about how we create more idea sets. And what it is, it's going to be creating this new urban environment. And this new urban environment that we're going to see in suburbs and exurbs as well as in downtown Toronto and Montreal and Vancouver. Where we've got transit that gets us to places where we can live and work and walk and, and, and interact and go to Starbucks. There's this great line about there's more deals that get done in the main floor coffee shops than in the boardrooms on the top floors. And why is that? It's because when you go into a boardroom, what have you got? You've got a list of my wants and a list of uh, where we're going to end up. But in the coffee shop, you have a conversation. You have idea sets. You end up talking to people about how we can get things to move forward. And that's the key. And so we're going into this new digital age, and it's going to change, I think, our cities in a dramatic way because the jobs are going to be in high uh, density urban cores. We're going to have a lower cost of infrastructure. We're going to have a higher cost of transit if we want that to exist. We're going to have a reurbanization, and we know that by just looking out the window out here at there's more condos being built in Toronto than in any other city in all of North America. We are moving back downtown uh, in a way that's not happened in the last 75 years. Climate change impacts are one of the drivers from that, a sense of place, walkable, livable, safer. It's surprising that actually there's more crime now taking place in suburban ghettos than there is in urban environments. What are the impacts of great transit? We know this. 
15 to 25 percent increase in land values when a, within a mile of a high density traffic transit node. You want to buy an expensive great house in Toronto, what you do is you go to within a mile of a GO train or a mile of a subway and stop. Employability goes up, and it's fascinating. People, people's statistics on how quickly they get jobs and how quickly their spouse gets a job when they move to a major city increases dramatically. The time reduces, the probability of getting that job increases if they're in a larger city. Because there's greater job opportunities. And even more, if you've got a family with adult children, you can do that in a, in a city where you can't do that in a suburban environment. Um, flexibility, resilience, the, the length of time to get a new job goes down in a major city than it is in a smaller city. Equity is actually uh, far better in a, uh, in a larger city. Entrepreneurship, we used to think about Silicon Valley in the suburbs as the way of getting entrepreneurship. Where is it happening today? It's happening in downtown Manhattan, it's happening in downtown San Francisco, downtown Toronto, that's where the entrepreneurship is taking. And again, livability, sociability, connectiveness. And so this, I think, is the second 5% I want you to think about. There's something about the left-hand side of this page, which is the software that I think you know about, which is cities, ideas, and the social capital, that trust factor that exists in cities. But you've got to create that with a hardware. And the hardware is dense, urban, mixed-use environments where you can get around with transit. And if you have one side without the other, it's not going to work and you have these together, you're gonna to end up creating a situation. So I've got two offices. I've got a huge office in the basement of an arena in Ottawa, where if I wanna see someone, it takes me 45 minutes to get to downtown Ottawa to see a banker, see a lawyer, whatever. I've got another office at Bay and Front. Where am I pr more productive? It's fascinating. I am far more productive in my office at Bay and Front because I will walk through the corridor every day and I'll see a five people that I know. I had three meetings yesterday all within a block of where I work. But my business is in Ottawa. But I work more productively, more efficiently in a dense urban environment city. And all of us know that, but we're not creating the cities that, uh, that are doing that. And go back, if, uh, if you could, to a second to that regression analysis that I told you about, where the mass of a city increasing increases the productivity. That linear regression fits almost perfectly, except when you don't have good transit. So London, Paris, New York are all above the line, above the regression line. Mumbai is below the regression line because you can't get around Mumbai. And so therefore, if you've got big cities but you can't get around, you'll lose the benefit of the, the agglomeration. You'll lose the benefit of the spillover impact. You'll lose the benefit of the middle of this page, which is all about connectivity. So, my point is that the way that we build our transportation network builds our cities. In the past we had roads, and what we ended up having was manufacturing in the suburbs and suburban sprawl. Today, we're building subways, LRTs, BRTs, uh, etc. and what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a very different environment. And the most important reason why is because millennials, when I graduated from university, you decided what company you wanted to work for and you went to where that company is. Today, millennials have changed the equation dramatically. Millennials decide where they want to live and companies follow them. And there's just been an announcement this week of two different companies that have left suburban uh, Mississauga to move to downtown Toronto. Why? Because this is where the people are, the creative people, the, the people that they want to employ are going to be. And so therefore, we've got to create a situation where they can live. And cities worldwide, they're addressing this. Take a look at Minneapolis, St. Paul. A fascinating example when you compare it to Toronto. What they did is about 15 years ago, they had a plebiscite for a 1% tax increase to build a, a beautiful transit system that was turned down. Minneapolis, St. Paul uh, stagnated for about 10 years. They redid the plebiscite, the exact same plebiscite. After the city got together, they passed the 1% tax. We're building a spectacular transit system right now. Denver, almost the exact same thing. Uh, Portland was interesting. Portland said, if we're going to create a city that is innovative, that is creative, we're going to have to get a lot more people into Portland. But if we do this by way of highways and parking lots, we're going to destroy the environment we have in Portland. So they built that. Uh, not necessarily just for economic reasons, but for livability reasons in, uh, in downtown Portland. And even in Ottawa, they're challenged right now in an interesting uh, campaign. It's, it's got some comparability to the Smart Track campaign uh, that we experienced four years ago, where the challenging candidate is saying, we need a grow train system. 
And it's fascinating. There's six different train lines in the Ottawa region that actually you can put GO trains on and dramatically transform the national capital region that, that haven't been talked about since someone talked about them, David Collinette, in 2006. So these ideas are coming back about how to create transit. In Boston, what they're doing is they're looking at a caterpillar system because they're saying it's too expensive to build subway, subway, subways like Rob Ford used to talk about, so they're building LRTs, but they don't want these massive big LRTs um, either in the road because they're slower than cars or above the road because they end up becoming, becoming, uh, creating a roof-like structure like the gardener. So there's one line going one way on the top of the caterpillar, another line going the other way on the bottom of the caterpillar. And then Portland, um, Bogota, and New York are building gondolas. They're taking the concept that's more appropriate of Blue Mountain or uh, Whistler and they're putting it in cities. And actually, they're really efficient transit systems. And why not do that if you've got hills or rivers or waterways in the uh, way? And to give you a little bit more uh, thinking, uh, what about bicycle interchanges? We had bicycle interchanges in the China of the old. Well, they're coming back now in Amsterdam and Copenhagen where people are separating bicycles because there was this big study that was released about two weeks ago that said the bicycle is the most efficient form of transit ever developed from a manpower uh, exertion standpoint to actually getting miles. And, and yet we've got to separate them from traffic. And then to get you thinking some more, how about uh, personal flotation vehicles that uh, buzz around Toronto Harbor? Maglev trains, bike share program, maglev trains. Has anyone been on the maglev that goes from the Shanghai airport to downtown Shanghai in eight minutes? It's a 45 minute drive. It is the most incredible experience other than something else I won't mention. It's just spectacular. And if you don't want to have, if you want to have fun, next time you go to China, Shanghai, the maglev train is unbelievable. It's over, I think it's 400 kilometers an hour. It's unbelievable. Electric cars, satellite based air traffic control systems with 5G that are going to dramatically change shared cars, smart roads, driverless cars. Transit is changing dramatically. Let me uh, give you a couple of ideas on how things could actually be changing in Toronto. The Western Freight Bypass, I think, is a transformational idea. You look at the top right-hand side of this page. In 1969, we took the CN traffic off of the, uh, the CN line that goes through downtown Toronto and got it up to Highway 7407. In 1969, there was a proposal made sir, by Abby if you're interested, by Nick Irwin, I think was his name. Uh, Neil Irwin, I apologize. To do the same thing. In 1969, it hasn't been done that. The Lake Megantic train that uh, derailed in Lake Megantic, guess where it went? Through Mississauga? through DuPont and Davenport, right by the Summerhill LCBO. Can you imagine if it blew up the Summerhill LCBO, we would have had a hue and cry to do a bypass around Toronto in no time flat. If we build this Western Freight Bypass, and interesting enough, when they built the 407, they left the right of way to do it. So we can actually do it. That whole mid line in the blue there becomes free for passenger rail that would dramatically transform transit around the uh, Toronto area. Right now, this is London, England. London, England has, as you probably know, one of the best transit systems in the world. But it's interesting, they think it's a good network, but it's not easy to get across London. And so they were saying, unless we can get across London, we're not going to be efficient. They were losing business with Brexit, they may still be, but they were losing business to Frankfurt because it took half a day to get from Heathrow to the city of London or to Kerry Wharf. So they built Crossrail. Crossrail is an $18 billion expense to connect rail across London. With the Western Freight Bypass, we've got this for no money. This mid-Toronto goes through Mississauga to uh, Kipling to Castle Loma to Summerhill to, uh, to the Science Center and out to the Toronto Zoo. As you may know, the Summerhill LCBO was the main passenger rail station for CP until World War II. So this is transformational for Toronto. And you know, we talked about uh, 5G, and one of the keys about 5G and about Facebook and about Google and about Amazon is it's a network. It's not one way to one way. Toronto, 97% of the people that use Go every day go to or from Union Station. If you've got 97 of the people that go to or from Union Station, you don't have a network. You've got a straight line. With this, we start to create a network. Let me give you some other uh, hi hypotheses and ideas to challenge you. Think about London versus Toronto. Heathrow has the Piccadilly Tube, the Heathrow Express, the Crossrail, and the Overground. Toronto Airport, we got the UPX, which is good, but nothing else that is rapid transit. The best rapid transit is the Toronto Rocket that's the most popular bus that goes from Kipling to uh, the Toronto Airport. Canary Wharf, which is the second largest employment zone in the city of Lon in the, in, 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 uh, London. It's got the Dark Docklands L ALRT, it's got the Jubilee Expansion, it's got the Crossrail. The second largest corporate zone in all of Canada is not Montreal or Vancouver, it's the airport corporate zone in Toronto and we've got no transit that goes there. 
And the Neptus Foundation five years ago did a report that said major cities worldwide, unless they've got transit between those two airport corporate zones, are like two different cities because they're not connected. Because if you're going from uh, your office by the airport and you got a meeting with a banker, you say, you come and see me. I'm not going to go to Bay King because it's going to take me 45 minutes to get there. But if you could hop on a transit, you'd be there in no time flat. Think about La Defense in Paris. Think about Canary Wharf in London. Think about Brooklyn or uh, New Jersey and New York City. Major cities worldwide that are successful that have two major employment zones are connected by transit, but Toronto, we don't have it. And it's a challenge. Think about sports. Has anyone tried to get on the GO train going west after a, BMO, a game at BMO Field? It's disgusting. You got 10,000 people trying to squeeze through one little stupid corridor that goes under the tracks up the other side and you gotta wait for a train. Olympic Park, six different rail lines in London. But the interesting thing about London is London had no transit built from World War II until 1989. What changed it was a Canadian company, the Reckman Brothers of Canary Wharf, that said we've got to get better transit in London. Today, 25, 35 years later, London is thought of as the best transit city in the world. And it's people like you that changed things. It wasn't government. Government didn't do anything until the Reichman Brothers, Canary Wharf, and all the other business people demanded that for economic development reasons we needed transit. Pearson uh, has been proposing a, a Union Station West, get away from this, uh, everything going through a Union Station, that's one of the solutions. Let me give you some other ideas to get you challenging. We've had a lot of talk in this current election campaign about a downtown relief line. This is the red line that they're talking about. It's projected at $7 billion to build a downtown relief line. Look at the blue and green. Just East of there, we sorry, just west of there, we've got two rail lines already owned by uh, Metrolinx that go through the Don Valley and go right down to Union Station that aren't being used, that could be uh, used. And what you could do is you could have stations at uh, Cherry Street, at Broadview, at uh, Thorncliffe Park, at Eglinton with the Eglinton Crosstown, at Oral Parkway to connect up with the Shepherd. And the challenge is that, as you probably know, look on the left-hand side here, the Broadview station is down the bottom of the river, sorry, the, the GO train is at the bottom of the ravine while the Broadview station is at the top of the ravine. It's half the distance of the Knightsbridge ex, uh, escalator in London. It's a quarter of the distance of the big escalators in the Moscow subway system. We could have something that gets people down there and goes down to Union Station in what? Half an hour like the downtown relief line would be from Pape? No, in seven minutes you would be downtown from the Broadview station. You build this, we could have it going in no time flat, and you would save $7 billion. Or the other one that I like on the right-hand side, do you know how far the, the main subway station and the Danforth go are apart from each other? 250 meters, which is less than the distance of the moving sidewalk in Terminal 1. Build a moving sidewalk, get people off of the, the subway, we could save $7 billion. The railway system that we have in Toronto is the potential solution that we've got. Um, a um, consultant that's working for Metrolinx in, 19, in 2006 said, the elevated LRTs work in Vancouver, they work in New York, they work around the world. Why are we trying to build subway, subway, subways or LRTs? For $600 million, we could build a LRT that goes from the Kennedy Station to the Scarborough Town Center along the 401 and connect up with uh, the Shepherd uh, subway line. There are other solutions. The airport corporate zone we talked about already has been a major challenge. We've got to find some way of getting there. There is a solution. The exact same thing was solved in New York with a sky train that goes from JFK up the middle of the Van Wise Expressway and connects up with the Jamaica Station, which is similar to Kipling, the last stop on the subway, the first stop on the regional Long Island Railway. And what's happened now is Jamaica Station has become, in Queens, one of the new uh, transit node metropolis growing areas in, uh, in all of uh, New York. When you take a look at this, it's fascinating. You may know this. Take a look at the bottom here, uh, right uh, by uh, the Long Branch Go Train Station. There is a rail line that goes from Long Branch to Kipling, owned by Metrolinx. If you took the Lakeshore West this weekend, the train actually went there on a diversion. Goes all the way to Kipling. And then you know what goes from Kipling to the airport? A hydro right away. You know what the cheapest way to build uh, transit today is? Is putting up a hydro right away. We've done that in, uh, in North Toronto. So there are other solutions other than building this Eglinton LRT or the Eglinton Smart Track that was going to build fixed rail across Eglinton, across the biggest gorge in all of Toronto at uh, the Jane Street and Eglinton uh, um, uh, intersection all the way to the airport. These are the potential solutions that we can think about. To change the top, which many people, I'm not sure whether Mr. IBI would agree with this, but I was described by Phil Beinhacker at one point in time as being the worst example of urban planning in the history of urban planning. Suburban 
strip malls and four and six lane roads that we have seen in Scarborough and North York and Markham and, and, and worse urban planning to what we've got on the bottom, which is not everywhere, but dense urban environments. And I present this sometimes in suburban uh, Toronto and they say, oh, you're gonna change all of us to, to downtown Toronto. Think about Young Street, half a block off of Young Street, you've got single family homes. So this kind of development doesn't change everything, but it does change the major arterial roads and transit nodes into a dense urban environment that millennials want to live in and we all want to work in and, uh, and live in. So together, if we work, we can change our cities to become more connective and more inclusive. And let me give you one other idea that I think is radical that our group is talking about. What about an immersed Gardner Expressway? To get rid of the Gardner Expressway and get people downtown on a brand new expressway that goes right along the edge of the water uh, and get us uh, downtown. There are things, there are radical things that we can do. And, uh, and Kathleen Wynne, when she was in power, may have said that uh, tolls on old infrastructure wouldn't be a good policy, but I'm convinced that tolls on brand new infrastructure, people would be more than willing to pay, particularly if we increase the capacity going downtown by 25%. How would you pay this as well? If you release the Gardner Expressway and the Lakeshore Boulevard, and I've been told by transit engineers that 87% of the users of the Lakeshore Boulevard use it as a service road to the Gardner Expressway, either getting on or off the Gardner Expressway or taking the Gardner Expressway, taking the Lakeshore Road when the Gardner Expressway is uh, too busy. 87% use it as a surf road. If you had good transit, you could get rid of most of Lakeshore Boulevard or turn it into a two or four lane road. You can realize $8 billion of real estate value by getting rid of the Gardner Expressway. So, how are we gonna live in the future? I believe it's gonna be mixed use, dense urban environments, whether they're in Toronto or whether they're in major arterial roads in suburbs. We're gonna change the fabric of our cities dramatically, probably more dramatically in the next couple of years than has happened since we went from horse and buggy to cars. Because we are no longer gonna be dependent on cars and highways to the extent that we have in the past. And how are we gonna thrive more and more is the spiking is gonna be important. It's gonna be dense cities, Going to Toronto, going to New York, making sure Toronto works, making sure Toronto works as a Toronto region, Vancouver, Montreal, all those things are going to end up being critically important. And how that's going to be solved? I believe that the Ubers and the shared vehicles and the autonomous vehicles will be a solution to the last mile, but you can't have that many people coming down the Gardner Expressway. It's not going to work. Um, every lane of traffic takes 1,200 cars per hour. Every GO train takes 1,200 cars every five to seven minutes. Transit is the solution, whether it be go train, subways, LRTs, or elevated LRTs, which have worked well in New York and Vancouver, and for some reason in Toronto, we poo-pooed them because we had a mayor that said subways, 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 and we thought that that was the only way we could solve our problem. What is it? It's two-way, all day, frequent, comfortable, clean, electrical, fast, massive transit, and it's up to us to get behind it because the problem we've got is we've got to get political decision-making out of transit where I promise that I'm gonna build whatever and I'm, I'm bound to that and I can't change my mind even if good, uh, good people at IBI tell me something differently. I gotta have a customer orientation, not an engineering orientation. You take a look at roads, roads go where people wanna go, tracks go where people wanna uh, go um, rather than the straight lines that the engineers uh, too often want. We need civic support from people like you rather than NIMBYism. We need a revenue business orientation. The vast majority of transit systems in Europe actually break even or make money from an operating standpoint. Every single transit system in North America loses money, both on an operating as well as on a capital standpoint. We can change our orientation um, and, and make transit actually make sense. Price, convenience, time ends up being critical. That S-curve that was shown earlier, as you get more frequent, what happened on the GO train when you took uh, GO train service, um, uh, doubled it um, and went from one hour to half an hour? It went up by more than twice, which is the S-curve. As, as you increase the availability, the supply of an asset that people really want, at one point in time, the uh, demand increases faster than the supply. We have to have a network orientation rather than focusing everything on one spot. We do have to have political leadership. And then, just like Nike said, we just got to get on and do it, and we need a bunch of cash. So if you're interested in any of this, um, this is my coordinates and or join the Transit Alliance or follow us on, uh, on Twitter at uh, Transit Alley. Uh, it's uh, been my pleasure to speak with you. Remember, idea sex, connectiveness, and mass public transit is the solution. Thank you very much.